Hello and welcome to this introduction to microbiology video. I'm Dr. Aled Roberts and in this video we're going to look at some of the history associated with virology, the discovery of viruses and some of the key influential figures that have shaped our understanding of their non-living nature. And so one of the first questions we should ask ourselves is what is virology? Well, virology is the branch of microbiology that specifically deals with viruses and includes topics such as their characteristics, how they reproduce and their interactions with host cells. Now, unlike other microorganisms studied in the field of microbiology, viruses are classed as non-living entities, which throws a few spanners in the works. Now, our understanding of viruses in disease processes and environmental application has taken hundreds of years to develop, with much of our understanding coming in the last 100 years or so, but it was the initial discoveries that were pivotal in propelling this field forward, and so we're going to go on a bit of a journey and look at how our understanding of viruses came to pass. And so it all started towards the end of the 19th century when Aldolf Meyer, a German chemist and plant pathologist, was investigating the cause of tobacco mosaic disease. This was the disease of the tobacco plant that resulted in a mottled pattern on the leaves, reducing the overall quality and yield of the product. Now in some of his early experiments, he showed that the disease could be passed from one diseased plant to another using the sap of the diseased plant. Now Mayer attributed this disease to bacterial microorganisms, as his observations were the same as his fellow colleagues looking into bacterial infections. However, it wasn't until 1892 when Dmitry Ivanovsky performed some experiments that identified the transmission of the tobacco mosaic disease was caused by a non-bacterial agent that was smaller than a bacteria. Now in order to do this, he took sap from a plant with the disease and passed it through a bacterial filter. This would stop any infectious bacteria from passing through, but anything smaller would be collected. After filtering the sap, he showed that the filtrate was still infectious and capable of causing disease, which was one of the first indications that something smaller than bacteria, maybe a toxin, could cause infectious diseases. Now a few years later, Martinus Bajanek continued Meyers and Ivanovsky's work, concluding that the agent causing the tobacco plants to become mottled was not a bacteria, as it was too small to be seen under a microscope and could pass through the finest of filters. This suggested that the liquid was infectious, to which he called it contagium vivum fluidum, meaning contagious living fluid, which is partially correct. He then went on to term this infectious agent a virus, which means poison in Latin, and from this he is widely credited as being the founder of virology. Now up to this point, all we knew about viruses was that they were smaller than bacteria and capable of causing disease. However, it was unclear whether viruses were living organisms or chemical substances, and the nature of viruses was a major question in biology. Now this question was partly answered by the biochemist and virologist Wendell Stanley. In 1935 he was able to experimentally show that viruses could be crystallised. Now this was an extraordinary finding because up until this point only non-living substances like salts, minerals and proteins had been known to crystallise. And so analysis of these crystals showed that they consisted of proteins or enzymes. This meant that viruses could have properties of both life and non-life, which was a revolutionary concept for virology and molecular biology at this point in history. And so just a year later, Frederick Borden and some of his colleagues identified the presence of ribose and phosphorus within the contagious liquid, meaning that the tobacco mosaic virus was a mix of RNA and protein, making it a ribonucleoprotein. Now this work was crucial in understanding the composition of a virus, however we had still not visualised one, so how could we be sure they really existed? Well this was where Ernest Rusker comes in. Through his scientific training he realised that electrons have much shorter wavelengths than light, and therefore they could be used instead of light as a way of visualising materials with greater resolving power. 
and this essentially led to the creation of the electron microscope in the early 1930s, which surpassed the magnification capabilities of the light microscopes available at the time. And if we fast forward to the late 1940s, the virus causing tobacco mosaic disease, the tobacco mosaic virus, was visualised for the very first time, showing that it was an order of magnitude smaller than the average bacterial cell that had been identified up to this point. Now this visualisation event was key, however the 1950s was where several major breakthroughs happened that allowed us to identify the structure of the virus particle and the function of its components. And so in 1955, Rosalind Franklin and Donald Casper identified the structure of the tobacco mosaic virus, with others showing that if you took purified RNA and proteins, you could reassemble the virus particle. Then, just a year later, RNA was identified as the infectious unit of the virus particle, and a few years after that in 1960, the amino acid sequence of the tobacco mosaic virus protein coat was determined, making it one of the very first proteins to be sequenced and push forward many aspects of microbiology, biochemistry, genetics and of course virology. And with that we come to the end of this video. Hopefully you found the content useful, informative and most importantly easy to understand. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.